As I'm going through the Lenten season this year, I'm making a, a, an additional observation about the scripture passages. Typically, Lenten is a time of preparation, preparing our own spirit, our soul, our understanding to celebrate Easter. But it seems that from last week and what we are looking at this week, that's not just preparation, but it's also how we prepare to create fruit, how we, how we prepare to co-create with God. So hear, hear this word from the Gospel of Luke. Now, there was some present at the time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. Unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied. Leave it alone for one more year, and I will dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then we'll cut it down. One of the things that this passage reminded me of today is why I choose to be a follower of Jesus. And, and I need you to hear that carefully because those words are chosen carefully. It's why I choose to follow Jesus. At one point of my life, I walked away from the church in 1992, and I thought I would go away from it completely. But during that period, I explored other avenues of, of faith. I explored Judaism. I thought, well, I enjoyed Old Testament so much in, in seminary that maybe I want to be a Jew. Till the rabbi says, have you heard the story of the Jews? <clears throat> no, you don't want to be a Jew. Just go be a better Christian. I thought, okay. I explored Buddhism. I explored the new age and spirituality, but I came back to Jesus. Not so much Christianity in the broad sense of the word, because Westboro Baptist Church are called Christians, right? A follower of Jesus, and I choose to. Why do I choose to? Because in my faith journey, he seems to most accurately and best illustrate the true nature of the divine. I find it ironic that in many churches and other religions as well, they portray God as an angry, vindictive, supernatural being who's ready to smote you at any moment if you break the rules. I find it extremely ironic in churches that promote this belief. That God is watching you everything you do. And it doesn't matter how many good things you do that one bad thing. And buddy, you've had it. Like a, like a roach in our house, right? I don't care. That sucker's gone, right? But what we see in this parable is a very different illustration of God. God is the gardener in the parable, not the landowner. God's the one who, when the landowner is impatient, says, cut it down. It's God, the gardener, who says, give me a year. Let me really work with this and nurture this and, and fertilize this tree. We'll, we'll see what happens in a year. Why do religions and churches portray God as someone so angry and vindictive, ready, ready to pounce on you. Why? Because if you're afraid, they can manipulate you, right? You can manipulate anybody who's afraid. Be afraid. Be very afraid. Now I'm going to have my way with you, right? Look, think about it. Abusers have used this tactic for centuries. A pedophile will tell the child victim, 
if you tell anybody, I'll kill your cat. Right? Or a man who beats his wife, if you tell anybody, especially your family, you wait to see what I do with your kids while you're at work. Right? If you're afraid, you can be manipulated. I believe that churches and religions portray this angry God because they have an incredible desire to project their sense of morality upon groups of people. So if you follow our plan, if you stick to our method, then you'll be safe. Otherwise, watch out. All right? One of the things that we see in this parable is God's incredible patience and how transformation takes place. Now, first of all, we see in the story that Jesus is challenging the popular belief at that time that if you suffer, then it's God punishing you. For he uses this, he responds to the news of some Galileans whose blood was mingled with Pilate's sacrifices. Or a wall or tower fell on a group of people and said, you might think they were worse sinners of all because of this. But I say what? No. And what I find amazing is that that concept, that idea, that when bad things happen, God is punishing us, even prevails today. But I choose to follow the words and the teachings of Jesus. And Jesus says, no, that has nothing to do with it. Look, if I choose to smoke, drink, and eat cheeseburgers three times a day, chances are I'm going to get bad health, right? It's not God punishing me because those are the choices I make. That's the consequence of the choices. Or let's say that someone is a philanderer and they cheat on their spouse. And they have one affair after another. Eventually it all comes to a head. And then the wife or the husband and the children all leave, leaving them with nothing. And they're, you know, they're feeling isolated and all alone. That's not God punishing them. That's a consequence of their choices and their behaviors. Or something maybe that all of us can relate to. If you're driving on 408 during rush hour and you're texting and reading your emails, chances are you're going to get in a bad car accident. And if you do, it's not God punishing you for doing those things. It is a consequence of your behaviors. What we see in the parable, Jesus is showing us something completely the opposite. The landowner did not see the fruit from the tree he had planted, so he was ready to cut it off. Very punitive and judge judgmental. But God in the parable is the gardener who says, hold on a moment. Let's just, let's just take a look and see. Jesus tells the people in the parable, repent, or you too will perish. Okay, so it seems like a little mixed message there, right? He said, well, God doesn't punish you and you're, because you're a worse sinner than other. but if you don't repent, you'll perish. Look, repent, typically in our religious upbringing, is, is a term that's used as you are a horrible, horrible sinner and human being. You are the scourge of the earth and give your life to Jesus and repent or else you're going to burn in heaven, or hell forever, all right? That's... that's the typical association. Repent simply means an about face. If I am choosing a life that is motivated by unhealthy beliefs and unhealthy behaviors, and I find that not only am I destructive to myself, but I'm destructive to everyone around me, repentance means I choose to discipline myself and recreate myself where I'm using healthier behaviors and healthier beliefs systems that motivate my behaviors, and now my life has become constructive rather than destructive. That's what repentance is. It has nothing to do with God judging and punishing you. If we persist in unhealthy beliefs and unhealthy behaviors, we will experience the consequences. The reality is, is that all of us have experienced both ends, right? We've made healthy decisions, we've made unhealthy decisions, we've experienced the consequences of both. That's a part of being a human being, it's the learning curve. So, repent means turn and about face. Be transformed. But how does that transformation work? It doesn't happen by being punitive. It happens through Nurturing, taking care of the soil, right? It happens through kindness, compassion. I had a football coach in high school 
who called us dogs and underachievers, were horrible. We used to get graded on every game. I had one game where I missed one block. I got a 99% on all of my, and all he did when we were watching the film is showing that one mistake over and over again. I had no regard for him, so I didn't care. But I knew when I was doing my best when I wasn't. What happened after three years of a coach telling your team that they're dogs? After three years, they started believing him. Most of them did, and quit trying, you see. Transformation, being our best, does not come from being punitive. It comes from compassion, honesty, hard work. It comes from tilling the soil of our heart and our soul. What kinds of seeds do we plant there? Do we see, sow seeds of doubt and anger and rage? Or do we sow seeds of confidence and belief and strength? God is the constant gardener that's tilling your soil so you and I can be the best people we can be. I believe that God creates the opportunities and it's up to us to walk through the door of those opportunities. But if I'm living in fear, right? If I'm living in fear, if I'm trying to live my life in such a way that I'm not going to make a mistake, right? Playing not to lose. I'm probably going to miss those opportunities because I'm focused on what? Just trying not to make a mistake. Or if I'm living in fear and I'm living plain not to lose and I'm listening to all the negative voices around me, I see that opportunity appear and I won't take it because I'm what? Afraid. I don't believe that the God we worship and serve and celebrate is a God who wants to punish. I believe it's a God who creates opportunities and opens doors and windows for us constantly. But it's up to us to take advantage of it and to take the risk. I, one of my favorite quotes from Richard Branson, the great entrepreneur of Virgin Atlantic and Virgin Records, and he says this, if somebody offers you an amazing opportunity, but you are not sure you can do it, say yes, and then learn how to do it later. Yeah. Take the opportunity and trust that when you step into it, you'll figure out what to do. This is how I see the Spirit of God working for us. God knows our capabilities. God knows what we're able to accomplish, just we sometimes consciously haven't caught up yet. Take the risk. Take the risk. Become that human being that you can be. I do not believe that God created us to live in this life stealthily. You know what I mean by that? You know, stealth, stealth aircraft, they can fly and not be detected by the radar. I've met so many people over my years that, that, who want to just be born and just fly under the radar, hoping no one will notice that they're here, that they're not here, that they just somehow can just cruise through life without doing anything. I believe God created us more than that. I believe God created us to be co-creators with God. I believe God created us to make our mark on this planet to do something constructive, to build something beautiful on this planet. Some people are called to do great and huge things and the world renowned, but everybody's called to do something. Most of us are just called to do the best we can. And when we look back on our lives, is there a path of destruction or is there a path of creativity? Look, I promise you this. Taking a big risk here. I promise you, God is not looking to punish you. We do enough of that to ourselves. God is not here overlooking, giving you that parental stare, right? Because you're not met. No, we do that to ourselves. God doesn't need to. God's off the hook on that. We are our worst enemies. Are we not? Look, the bad things that happen to us in this life, sometimes it's a result of natural disasters. We have nothing to do with it, or we're a victim of circumstance. But most of the bad stuff that happened to us in our lives are things that we've created because of what we think and believe about ourselves. And I promise you this too. 
full of promises today. That if you believe you are lesser than and you're not capable and you're doomed for failure, you will attract all the people in the world who want to validate that belief for you. However, if we take that risk to allow the constant gardener fertilize our heart and our soul and to teach us and we start to grow in strength and character and discipline and we have a greater sense of who we are and what our purpose is and we're willing to fulfill our purpose no matter what happens, we no longer care what they think about us because we know what we are doing and why we are doing it. You see, that's the switch. If you give your power to everyone else, they will try to define you and I promise you they're not going to do it in your best interest. It's up to us. It's up to us. We can have resourceful people all around us. We can have people like my, my old coach Stokes, right? I loved him. And we, we can, I can see something in you when we don't see it ourselves, right? But eventually we need to make that transition is not what coach thinks about me. It's not what my grandparents think about me. It's not what Simon Cowell thinks about me on American Idol and America's Got Talent. It's what I think about myself. Because it comes down to you and me and the divine. Every week I talk about my sermon and my sermon notes with, with staff when we have our staff meeting. And Latrell writes the liturgy from it. Kevin chooses the music from it. And Chris works the children's. And as Latrell and I were talking about this passage, she came up with some really interesting insights and she gave me permission to use them. And I gave her full credit, but she says, you know, when you're fertilizing soil, soil for growth and transformation, fertilizer doesn't smell so good. Sometimes as we're being transformed and becoming the best we can be, it doesn't smell or feel so good. Sometimes some pruning needs to take place. Sometimes, but you see, if we have a belief system that somehow when something that doesn't smell good enters in our life, that God's punishing us, then we won't allow that process to continue. Or if we think because we're being cut back a little bit and having to kind of reassess ourselves that that's God punishing us, then we're not going to be curious enough to see where this is going to lead. This is the myth I want to break. This is the myth I want to obliterate. God is not punishing you. God wants you to fully be the, crea the creation that God created you to be. And sometimes in that transformation, sometimes as God is nurturing the soil of our soul, it may stink. It may feel bad, but it's not done as a punitive means. It's done from a, a place of love and kindness and nurture. How many of you have children? Do you, how many of you do not allow your children to do everything they want to do? <laughs> Is it because you're mean and, you, and you're wanting to be punitive? Jerry Picard says yes, but <laughs> we'll have a different class for Jerry later. All right. And Jerry, it will involve bricks, but okay, don't worry about it. Now, if we sometimes disappoint our children and spoil their fun in the moment because we're nurturing their character, then think how much more so God is doing that for us. That's what I want you to start. I want you to believe that with all your heart and your mind and your soul. God is never, ever, ever, never, 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 ever, 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 never, ever, 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 never, ever, ever, ever against you. Do I need to repeat that or did you get it? Another thing that Latrell brought up too is that like the owner of the vineyard, because the tree was not producing at a pace that he wanted it to, he wanted to cut it off. And I thought this insight from her was just really, really keen. How often does the punitive gardener inside of our psyche want to cut us off before we're ready to be matured and to create and produce the fruit we want to create? Right? We're too ready to, to cut things off before their time. Then Latrell shared this story. I love this story. In the early 1900s, two young boys, eight-year-olds, went to school, and they were the first ones in the classroom, and it was a cold day. 
and there's a potbelly stove in the schoolhouse. So one of the boys took what he thought was kerosene and poured it into the, to the stove. But what he was actually pouring into the stove was gasoline. And when they lit the stove, the stove exploded, killing that one boy instantly and severely burning the legs of the other boy. The eight-year-old was in the hospital. The doctors looked at his legs and they said, I'm sorry, mom and dad, but these burns are too severe. If they get infected, his whole body could get infected and he could die, so we need to amputate his legs now. And his parents said, let's wait till tomorrow and take a look and see then. So the doctors came in, and sure enough, they looked as, we need to amputate now. said, let's give it one more day. And after a few weeks of giving it one more day, his legs started to heal. The doctors were amazed. They said, well, he's going to have one leg that's going to be two and a half inches shorter than the other. He'll never be able to walk again. And his parents said, well, let's just wait and what? See. One day, the doctors walk into his hospital room, and the boy's hobbling around on crutches. They're amazed. But then they tell the parents, well, he may be able to hobble around on crutches, but he'll never be able to walk again. And his parents says, well, let's just wait and see. The next thing you know, the doctors walk in, and the little boy is now walking on his own without any crutches at all. They said, well, this is pretty miraculous. He might be able to walk, but he will never be able to run. And his parents says, well, let's just wait and see. Then one day, the little boy broke into a jog from his run. The little boy that I'm talking about is an American Olympian named Glenn Cunningham. He participated in the 1932 and 1936 Olympics. He scored medals, he came in second in the 1500 meters. He set a world record in 1994, I mean, sorry, 1934, for the mile at four minutes, 6.8 seconds. That record held for three more years. A person who was told he did not need his legs, they should be cut off, became an Olympian. And guess what? This many years later, we're still telling his what? Story. And this many years later, because that boy's parents weren't quick to cut him off, they were willing to wait and see his story inspires me, and hopefully it inspires you. I believe the true nature of God is the gardener in the, in, the, in the vineyard. I believe the true nature of God is the hope and the patience of the parents of Glenn Cunningham. I believe the true nature of God is one that wants to see you become your most full self and for you to co-create God. Create something wonderful. It doesn't matter how big it is. We're not measuring. It's not a contest. What can you give? What can you create? Whose life can you influence as others have influenced yours? What can you do to make this world a better place? I've asked you to do this assignment over the years, and I'm going to ask it again today because some of you are new. I want you to go home sometime during this week. And I want you to walk into your bathroom, close and lock the door. If you need to put do not disturb on the outside, we'll hope that your family will honor it. I want you to look in the mirror. And I want you to look at yourself in the eyes and I think, my hair is kind of ragged today. Or I got to do something about the 11Zs on my forehead. Or my complexion, I think I'm due for a facial. I want you to look in the mirror and I want you to look in your eyes, just like you do your lover, Right? Or your dog or your cat, whatever. Just look into the eyes. Look into the window of the soul. And after you've looked at yourself, really looked at yourself for a period of time, I want you to say, I love you for who you are right here and now. I love and honor you. And then I want you to just be conscious of what takes place next. I can love you. God, the constant gardener, can love you. Jesus can love you. But before we can truly become our creative selves, it's important that you love yourselves. You're not in trouble. 
you're off the hook. God's not going to punish you. God loves you. Love yourself. All right. Somebody broke out in the course before I got finished. (laughs) Maybe that was a sign. (laughs) Who do you want to be? What do you need to do to become that person? When you've defined those things, be persistent, be patient, be kind, be generous, be merciful, be loving, and work really, really hard. And what you will discover is the transformation that you've always longed for. Who do you want to be? What do you need to do to become this person? And then just be it. Thus ends the lesson. Let us pray. Gracious, loving gardener God, we often are amazed and share photographs of the beautiful creation outside of us. The sunsets, the oceans, the mountains, flowers, children playing, dogs being silly. And we're fascinated with all the beauty around us. Help us to see that same beauty within us. That I function in this world not because I'm afraid of being punished eternally, but I function in this world because of what I want to be and what I can create in alignment with your spirit and my spirit. Empower, empower each and every soul here this morning to be the patient gardener of their own soul as your spirit and our spirit works together to produce the incredible human being that we see in Jesus and that also we see within ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.